Hello, everyone, and welcome to our 15th week in our course on drugs and behavior. Uh, this will actually be our final week that has new content. Uh, next week will, of course, be the week of the final exam, so there will be a lecture just for the purposes of review, uh, going over material from the second half of the course, uh, and sort of wrapping up content and, and, and looking at trends in what we've studied so far in the course uh, and trying to bring it all together. But there will be no new content next week, um, just the final exam, which everyone should have gotten an announcement about uh, earlier this week. Uh, okay, so this lecture will be about performance-enhancing drugs, uh, and then next lecture will be about two topics, drug prevention and drug treatment. Uh, obviously, these are related topics, uh, but we'll cover both of those next time in Lecture 30. Okay, so we're going to look at performance-enhancing drugs, and, and this will be largely from the perspective of athletics. Uh, we've talked a little bit about cognitive enhancers uh, in our section on stimulants, and of course there really are no cognitive enhancers for uh, sophisticated cognition. You can enhance reaction time uh, for simple tasks, but there's no drug that will make you appreciably smarter than you were before. Uh, so we're going to be talking about largely about physical performance, not mental performance here. Uh, so performance en en enhancing drugs have a long history. Um, they have a relatively short history in terms of what's actually effective. Um, but performance enhancing drugs are, of course, a large part of many folk medicine traditions. Uh, so they have a history. We'll talk about some of that more recent history than ancient. Uh, we'll also talk about what the effects are for performance enhancing drugs. Uh, so when we think of performance-enhancing drugs, especially with regard to athletics, uh, we usually think of steroids. And we'll, we'll talk about that in this lecture. Uh, but there are other drugs as well. And they have different effects and different side effects. Uh, we'll talk about the legal status at the end of the lecture. Uh, so some of these substances are more regulated than others. Um, again, one of our criteria for drug scheduling is whether the substance has a legitimate medical use. Uh, and especially steroids, have a number of legitimate medical uses, despite the fact that they can be used uh, in an inappropriate manner. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at three basic groups. Uh, one is the stimulants, which we've already spent a whole week on, uh, so we're not going to go into the details uh, on how stimulants work, because we've already covered that. Uh, we'll go over steroids, which we haven't talked about yet, uh, and then there's some other compounds, sort of a miscellaneous group. Um, and all these things are used as performance-enhancing drugs. Uh, most of these that we'll talk about are psychoactive in some way. Uh, a couple are not, but they fall in the class performance-enhancing drugs. Uh, so we'll go over them briefly. Uh, first, though, last week's discussion questions. Uh, last week, of course, we were talking about opioids. Uh, and one of the topics was about overdoses. Um, so it turns out that uh, single drugs can, of course, be harmful if too much is taken. Um, but more often than not, uh, the combination of different drugs is far more dangerous than any drug taken in isolation, even taken in, more, uh, in a larger dosage than is appropriate. Uh, so how do we deal with this danger? Um, we often hear drug campaigns that deal with one drug at a time, um, or we, hear, we look at literature that deals with the dangers of alcohol, or the dangers of tobacco, or the dangers of prescription drug abuse. Um, but the fact is that combining these things uh, is far more dangerous and doesn't get nearly as much coverage. Uh, so most of the responses emphasized education. So advising people about the dangers uh, of combining various drugs. Uh, and as we'll see next lecture, uh, education only gets us so far uh, that there's some evidence that the problem is not knowledge. Um, nevertheless, it is part of the problem, uh, not the entire problem, as we'll see, but part of it. Uh, and so educating people about the dangers of mixing drugs is very important. Uh, and of course, as I mentioned, most anti-drug campaigns either talk about drugs sort of generically, uh, for example, in the, in the My Anti-Drug campaigns, uh, or they are targeted at particular drugs. Uh, when in fact there really aren't any campaigns about mixing drugs, which again is, is actually far more dangerous. Uh, and one of the most common 
drugs to mix is, of course, alcohol, because alcohol use is so uh, pervasive in our culture. Uh, but it turns out that many drugs are far more dangerous if they're combined with alcohol, especially depressants and some of the opioids, because those drugs, uh, the opioids have depressant-like effects. Uh, but if you combine multiple drugs that have similar effects, uh, you can get very negative consequences, like overdoses. Uh, so that's one of the ideas, is, is altering anti-drug uh, campaigns and anti-drug material to emphasize that combining drugs uh, is at least as dangerous as any of the individual drugs that are being covered. Uh, some of the posts uh, also emphasize the role of doctors and pharmacists. So these are healthcare providers that have deep knowledge, or should have deep knowledge, uh, about different drugs, and particularly uh, what different, how different drugs interact. So your doctor will usually tell you if this drug shouldn't be taken with alcohol or will be mindful of all the different medications that you take. Uh, and of course, especially for a recreational drug user, the average recreational drug user uh, doesn't know which drugs not to combine, especially when some are recreational and some may be prescription. Uh, pharmacists similarly know obviously a lot about the drugs they're dispensing. Uh, and so they can say which drugs shouldn't be combined, uh, which drugs shouldn't be taken with alcohol. Uh, but again, the number of possible combinations is fairly exhaustive. So now we go back to education. Uh, the other question was about uh, the drug naloxone, which is an opioid antagonist and, and can be used to counteract an opioid overdose that's in progress. Uh, so the consensus was that naloxone should be accessible uh, to opioid users. Uh, the question was how how do we how strictly do we control that access? Do we only provide it in hospital settings? Uh, should it be just available over the counter? Uh, because the idea uh, is that someone undergoing an opioid overdose probably needs help administering naloxone. Once you're in an opioid overdose, you may not physically be able to administer the naloxone. Uh, so that that's that's a hard question to answer. The the counterpoint to providing naloxone is, well, if we start providing naloxone, do we create the impression that opioid use isn't dangerous or isn't to be discouraged? Um, so sort of a, a tacit approval idea uh, if we provide naloxone. Um, whether that's true empirically or not, we don't know. Um, that, that, that is, of course, one of the biggest ways, one of the best ways to answer a question is to go out there and see what happens, um, to look at whether naloxone availability actually affects uh, rates of opioid use. Um, so, of course, controlling the accessibility to naloxone may sound uh, good, but one thing we have to keep in mind uh, is that, again, someone in the process of an opioid overdose can't necessarily get themselves to a hospital. Uh, and then finally, if we do provide naloxone to the public, we need to educate the public on what to look for, what are the signs of an opioid overdose, uh, and also how do we administer naloxone. Um, so sort of a two-pronged education campaign there. Uh, but again, the consensus was that naloxone should be accessible. Uh, it could save a lot of lives. It's actually very fast-acting, uh, counteracts opioid overdoses very quickly because it, and, uh, it binds to those same opioid receptors. Uh, okay, so that is it for discussion. Obviously, this week will be our last uh, week of discussion. So participate using your same discussion groups, uh, and there will not be, of course, a discussion during finals week. Okay, so first things first, talking about performance-enhancing drugs, uh, the first thing is, what do they do? And they can have a variety of effects. I mean, the glib answer is that they enhance performance. Uh, but more specifically, uh, commonly they increase muscle mass. Of course, when we talk about this class of drugs, we're thinking about steroids and other legal substances like creatine. We'll talk more about that later. Uh, performance enhancing drugs can also increase overall size, muscle size, but also the size of other tissues. And if someone is still growing, they can increase height. Uh, and here we're talking about human growth hormone, uh, which can be available by prescription uh, to individuals that have deficiency but can also be used by athletes uh, to increase muscle mass. Although, as we'll see, the effectiveness of that uh, is in some question. Uh, 
uh, also increasing speed and endurance. Uh, so here we're talking about stimulants in particular, which as we'll see are a very popular group of performance enhancing drugs that most people are not aware of. Uh, they're aware of stimulants in general, of course, but they're not aware that they're very commonly used uh, in professional athletics. Um, and then there's erythropoietin, uh, also known as EPO. This comes up, in, particularly in cycling scandals. Uh, this is a substance that promotes the generation of red blood cells. It's not psychoactive, so we won't talk about it that much, but it does increase endurance via a totally different mechanism. But it is something that is regulated by, uh, by organizations that govern sporting events. Of course, there's analgesia. Uh, people that are heavily active physically uh, also are more prone to injury and long-term stress in their body. Uh, and so they tend to have at least acute recurrent pain, if not chronic pain. Uh, and now we talk about analgesia as a potential performance enhancer. If you can take a drug that knocks out your pain, then you're not going to be distracted by it. It's not going to impede your performance. Um, so here we're talking about not so much the opioids, because those tend to sort of counteract athletic performance, uh, but other analgesics um, uh, that are there in common use. Of course, one thing performance enhancing drugs do, in addition to the qualities the user is looking for, uh, they also produce side effects. Uh, and of course, these side effects depend on which drug is being used. Uh, so a, a big question, especially when we're talking about improving athletic performance, is why do we care? Uh, so we've talked about drug use in general and, and drug abuse uh, that can lead to negative consequences up to and including death, uh, and that are at times have been fairly pervasive in society. Um, now we're talking about people who are doing better in a sporting event. So how much do we care? Uh, there are a variety of arguments for why we should care. Uh, one is that having athletes that, that take uh, performance-enhancing drugs and aren't uh, punished for it in any way uh, has an impact on children, that athletes are often role models for children, and so if they witness this behavior, um, what is that going to do to their own behavior? How are they going to learn from that lesson that somebody takes these drugs in order to perform better in the sporting event? How strong do you think that argument is? Is up for debate? Should a 20-year-old in a particular athletic event be a role model for children? Role model for children? It's up to you. Uh, but that is one of the arguments that's put forth. Uh, the other big one, of course, is that it violates our concept of fairness, that using performance-enhancing drugs is somehow unfair. Uh, this will actually be a topic of, of one of the discussion questions is there are a variety of ways in which one athlete might have an advantage over another. Uh, performance enhancing drugs are just one of those ways. So to what degree should we focus on that particular aspect? Uh, finally, and what I think is the most important one, is that it does have an impact on health. Uh, and so performance enhancing drugs affect the health of not only the individual that uses them, uh, but also on those around them. I mean, obviously, especially in a uh, sport with heavy contact like football, um, you have, if you have somebody who's taken a lot of performance-enhancing drugs, they can do more harm to the people around them. Uh, and also there are psychological effects for some of these substances. Um, and that way they, they can impart sort of a social harm to those around them, even not on the playing field. So those are all reasons why we, we could and probably should care. So actually, before we get to steroids, which again are what we usually think of uh, when we bring up the topic of performance-enhancing drugs, uh, we'll talk about stimulants, which is a topic we've already covered. Uh, so in this arena, they're often referred to as ergogenics, that is, energy-producing compounds. Uh, and these have been around for a long time. Some were sort of fanciful. They were folk medicine, didn't really work. Um, but there is some evidence that the ancient Greeks and the Aztecs and other groups uh, did have natural substances that may have had stimulant-like effects. Uh, more recently, uh, you have substances like strychnine, which today is a substance we all associate with poison. So it's used as rat poison, um, but obviously it's poisonous to humans as well. Uh, but in smaller doses, 
it, it acts as a stimulant to the central nervous system. Um, you have too much of it, you get convulsions and eventually death, uh, but in small doses, it acts as a stimulant. Uh, but of course, strychnine was involved in, in quite a few deaths uh, in the 1800s up through the early 1900s. Uh, its use kind of tapered off in the 1960s uh, because of the rise of amphetamines. Uh, for cocaine, cocaine was, of course, around longer than before amphetamines. Uh, it was around in, uh, for the last couple hundred years. Uh, but cocaine was, has never been as popular a performance-enhancing drug, mainly because its effects just don't last that long, uh, especially for endurance contexts. And endurance is one of the things that stimulants seem to enhance uh, for appreciable periods of time. Uh, so amphetamines soon, once they were developed, soon became a very popular performance-enhancing drug. Uh, of course, they were used in World War II on both sides of the war. Uh, we've already talked about this in our unit on stimulants. Uh, but they'd been synthesized just a couple, uh, couple decades before World War, II, World War II. And once the war was over, uh, more and more people knew about amphetamine. Uh, and they've caused actually a number of deaths through overdose uh, in competitive events, uh, mainly because they, they raise body temperature. Uh, and so athletes, of course, are exerting themselves, have a higher body temperature anyway because they're generating a lot of body heat. And especially in outdoor events, um, they can also prevent you from sweating as much as you should. So that combination of being in a hot environment generating more body heat than you usually would and not sweating as much as you usually, as you usually would uh, have led to death. Uh, and of course, after World War II, they became more popular and regulatory authorities began to notice that amphetamines were becoming more popular. Uh, and so there was an increase in testing. And of course, eventually, there were the drug abuse control amendments uh, of the mid-60s, which we talked about uh, in our unit on drug policy and regulation. Uh, and so you have uh, a crackdown, so to speak, uh, on amphetamine use, both outside of athletic competition, but also with regard to athletics. Uh, so, of course, a big question is, do they work? They have their dangerous side effects, um, but what's the incentive to take them? Uh, so they do, as we've already seen in our unit on stimulants, have a few consistent effects. They improve alertness, uh, so wakefulness, when somebody's engaged in a, in a long competition, a long race, or have to play two games in one day, uh, amphetamines increase wakefulness. They fight fatigue. Uh, improvements in reaction time. So your reflexes are faster. Uh, they also seem to improve endurance. So, again, because this idea of combating fatigue. Uh, and the fact is that the studies show that these improvements are really pretty small. But the fact is that a 1% improvement can be a big deal in an athletic competition. So here you have a picture of uh, Usain Bolt, uh, the Jamaican sprinter, and here's, he's next to his world, new world record. And I'm, just to preface, not saying that Usain Bolt was using any sort of performance enhancer. I'm just pointing out that Bolt's new world record beat the previous world record by around a tenth of a second. Um, so that 1% can make the difference between second place and a new world record. Uh, so that 1% improvement sounds small, but if you are a professional athlete, that can, that can make a big difference. Uh, of course, stimulants have their side effects. Um, there are cardiovascular effects, although uh, those seem to be not as, as prevalent in younger individuals. Um, the bigger danger, as I mentioned, is this increased body temperature. And there are athletes that seem to have died from that. Uh, of course, there are the psychological effects, uh, things like anxiety, paranoia, and insomnia. Um, so these are all negative side effects. These are unwanted. Um, but again, if you're looking to be alert, if you're looking to stay awake and alert through that double header, then afterwards you may actually suffer insomnia. Um, that is the negative side effect. It promotes wakefulness not just when you want it, uh, but at all times. Okay, moving on to the second group of performance-enhancing drugs, and the most famous, uh, that's the steroids. So steroid itself doesn't necessarily mean an, a performance enhancer uh, or what we think of in terms of 
fit to use in athletics, a steroid is a chemical designation. So there are a lot of different steroid compounds, and you may have been prescribed some yourself. Um, so over here on the right is a, a diagram showing what basically the criterion is to be classified as a steroid. It's these four hydrocarbon rings uh, in this particular configuration. Any chemical compound that looks like this, that has these four rings in it, um, is a steroid. So it includes things like cholesterol, which we know from its effects on cardiovascular health, uh, but cholesterol is an important part of your cell membrane. You can't live without it. Uh, but it's a steroid, as is cortisol, which is a hormone that's released in response to stress, and it's sold as hydrocortisone. So this is a steroid. Obviously, it's not one that's going to uh, increase your muscle mass, but it is nevertheless a steroid. Uh, there's also estradiol, which is, when, when people say estrogen, this is usually what they mean. Technically, estrogen is a group of related compounds, of which estradiol is the most important. Um, but that is a steroid, as is its male counterpart, testosterone, which is an androgen. And there are multiple androgens. Uh, but testosterone uh, does things in, during puberty, um, like increase muscle mass, increase size, and of course it produces uh, secondary sexual effects like facial hair, the deepening of the voice. Uh, and so at first testosterone uh, was used as a, a performance enhancer, but fairly quickly it was discovered um, that what, what athletes really wanted was, that was a substance that had the muscle building and the recuperative effects of steroids, of testosterone, um, without the masculinizing effects. So they wanted enhanced muscle development and enhanced recovery time uh, without the masculinizing or androgenic effects. So facial hair, deepening of the voice, the, the sort of secondary sexual characteristics that we associate with male development. Uh, and there was a, a, later than you would think, uh, there was sort of a scandal in Major League Baseball. So Major League Baseball had been testing uh, for steroids, and it was rumored uh, that steroid use was actually fairly common uh, in the U.S. in Major League Baseball. Uh, and there was what's called the Balco scandal in 2003, um, which was this, this company, uh, this Bay Area uh, laboratory company, had developed a steroid that was anabolic, uh, which in, in, in anabolic in this case means it promotes tissue growth. Um, so it promotes muscle development in particular. Uh, and what this, what the scandal was, was this company had developed a steroid uh, that wasn't detected by Major League Baseball's tests. And so a lot more players were using steroids than Major League Baseball was aware of. Uh, but because they weren't testing for this compound, uh, it was getting through. Later, of course, they, they amended their tests. So now that substance is screened for. Uh, so what do steroids do? Well, there are the obvious physical effects, and here we're talking about anabolic steroids, so steroids that build up the body. That's what anabolic means. Um, one of the most important effects is it decreases recovery time. So anytime your body is damaged, whether it's through working out or through some sort of injury, um, steroids can cut down that recovery time. This is used both in, in hospital settings and in athletics. So you can work out twice as often. Uh, and of course, Famously, anabolic steroids in, increase muscle mass and, and, and increase strength. At first, it was ambiguous whether they really increase strength. We'll come back to this idea later. Uh, but now the evidence is pretty conclusive. Now, the question, though, is, sure, anabolic steroids improve muscle mass, increase muscle mass, um, but that's typically, a, these, these steroids legitimately are typically applied to individuals with low levels of testosterone or whatever steroid of interest you have. Um, so the question is, sure, they can enhance when someone is deficient in a, in a steroid hormone. Uh, what if their hormone levels are normal? What would testosterone or testosterone imitators uh, do in that case? And there the evidence is a little hazier. It's not, a, it's not clear exactly how big an effect steroids have when your testosterone levels are normal. Um, Generally, for anyone, uh, testosterone or compounds that imitate it, the anabolic steroids, 
uh, have androgenic effects. So they promote facial hair growth, uh, they deepen the voice, um, but they also increase muscle mass. Uh, but in, in the long term, there is some connection between uh, taking too many steroids, and here athletes take massive amounts of steroids. Um, so again, that's one of the reasons the evidence isn't entirely clear, uh, because you can't conduct a study taking that much hormone, it's not ethical. Uh, but athletes nevertheless take massive amounts of these hormones and usually do what's called stacking, which is taking multiple hormones at once. Uh, and there's some evidence that this later causes, it increases the risk of heart disease. Uh, and for males, uh, prolonged and, uh, and, and, and large magnitudes of steroids uh, can actually eventually cause atrophy of the testes, the sexual organs. Um, and what's called gynecomastia, which is the development of breast tissue. Uh, so this first one seems a little counterintuitive. If you're increasing these, these masculinizing effects, why would it atrophy the testes? Well, the answer is that if you're basically taking a bunch of testosterone or something like it, um, the testes, in a, in a way, no longer have a job to do. So they atrophy because there's enough testosterone in the body already. They don't need to produce any more. Um, so these are just some of the negative side effects uh, of steroids. Uh, for the male population. Uh, for women, of course, the effects are those androgenic effects, deepening of the voice, growth of facial hair, acne, uh, these sorts of things. Psychologically, uh, there's some evidence that steroids have psychological effect. Um, certainly, uh, most users report that they can tell when they're on steroids, uh, that they have elevated mood, uh, that they feel like they have more energy, and this leads us to what's called the active placebo effect. And what that is, is it's not necessarily that steroids, anabolic steroids, increase muscle mass, but they change the person's perception of their body. They change sensation. They change the individual psychologically. And it's actually that psychological change that causes them to work out more, for example. So the psychological change induced by steroids uh, causes the person to change their behavior and that's what changes their physiology. So that's what the active placebo effect is. It's not a direct link between steroids and physiology, but one that's mediated through psychology and through behavior. Now, there's also what we've all heard of as roid rage, uh, which is the idea that individuals taking steroids uh, are more prone to losing their temper, uh, more prone to violent confrontation. Uh, there's some evidence of that, uh, but of course, there's also, once that idea is embedded in the public mind, uh, that can be taken advantage of. So you can blame steroids for violent outbursts, uh, when in fact it may not have been the steroids at all. Uh, and of course, in, athlete, in athletics, you're already, especially for certain sports, you're already selecting for a population uh, exhibiting aggressive behavior. So it's not that surprising uh, that individuals continue that aggressive behavior outside uh, of the sports uh, event. Uh, anyway, so roid rage, the, the, there's some evidence for it. Um, and again, we see other effects as well that are psychological, like depression. So when the user is on steroids, their mood tends to become elevated. When they go off, they tend to become depressed. Uh, and so that's just another psychological effect of steroids that seems to be valid. Uh, okay, but it's not just stimulants and steroids that are performance-enhancing drugs. Uh, you also have human growth hormone, which has come uh, to be popular in, in recent years. Uh, of course, early on it wasn't available. Uh, but this is something naturally produced by your pituitary gland. Uh, it's what causes the body to grow so much during puberty. Uh, but of course, taking even more of it does increase overall growth, not just of muscle tissue, but of the entire body. Um, so if you're still, if you're an individual that's still growing, and you take human growth hormone, you will grow taller than you otherwise would, given that you're taking regular doses of human growth hormone. Uh, and in fact, for individuals that are deficient in human growth hormone, this can help them reach an average height. Uh, there's some question as to the psychological effects of human growth hormone. Um, in individuals that are low, that are deficient uh, in HGH, uh, there's some evidence for, for an increased likelihood of depression. So human growth hormone may, may uh, prevent depression, but only, again, in the sense that without it, 
he would be deficient. Um, so it's not the idea that taking human growth hormone will make you happier if you have normal levels, but if you have low levels, it does seem to fight off, fight off depression. And of course, HGH is also involved in brain development. Um, so it is, in a sense, a cognitive enhancer insofar as it fosters uh, cognitive development for the developing brain. Uh, but again, we have a question of how effective it is uh, in athletes. So for certain steroids and for human growth hormone, you have this increase in muscle mass, but there's limited evidence that you actually have an increase in strength. Uh, so what may be happening is that the muscles themselves grow, but it's because they hold more water. That these hormones these and, and steroids may increase the amount of water that is retained by the muscles, so it increases your, your lean body mass, increases your muscle mass, but you're not increasing strength. All you're doing is adding more water to the muscles themselves. Uh, and of course, there are performance enhancing drugs that are non-psychoactive. So I'll mention those briefly here. There are the, the beta-2 agonists, uh, which are sympathomimetics. That means they activate the sympathetic nervous system, uh, particularly the lungs. But they don't have, it's, they're more specific. So they don't have all uh, the sympathetic effects that, for example, amphetamines do. Uh, by the way, the, the beta-2 agonist is acting uh, at an adrener adrenergic receptor, which is the receptor that responds to adrenaline, otherwise known as epinephrine. Uh, you also have creatine. Uh, which is thought to basically supplement the body's energy supply. Uh, and again, this is one of these compounds that seems to increase muscle mass, uh, but perhaps not strength. So maybe creatine is just pulling more water into the muscles. Uh, it should be noted that, cre that creatine also, if, if it is helpful, helps in short sprints. So it doesn't really help with endurance. Uh, it helps with short-term strength if it helps with anything at all. Uh, and then there's erythropoietin, uh, which is, again, the chemical that signals your body to produce more red blood cells. Red blood cells are, of course, the part of your circulatory system that carry oxygen and nutrients. So the more of those you have, uh, the quicker you can replenish your body, muscles that are, that are replenish muscles that are active, uh, with the energy and the air they need. Uh, it, of course, is heavily regulated by sporting bodies, especially in cycling, so there are EPO scandals every now and again, uh, but the erythropoietin itself is not psychoactive, so we're not going to spend a lot of time on it. Uh, okay, now moving into regulation of, of performance enhancing drugs. One distinction to make, of course, is the difference between government regulation of a substance and the organizational regulation. So a substance may be legal for the public domain, uh, but would disqualify a participant if they tested positive for it in an athletic competition. Uh, so here on the right is a table from your book, uh, and this is the these are the penalties for using performance enhancing drugs uh, in Major League Baseball. And so there are steroids and there are amphetamines uh, listed. So as it turns out, the penalty for steroids uh, is far more severe than that for amphetamines, uh, and, there, and that's an issue of some controversy. Amphetamines are actually more common. Uh, amphetamines are far more common than steroids in terms of their use in athletic endeavors. Uh, so that's been brought into question whether the penalty should be less severe for amphetamines than for steroids. Uh, so that is one of the controversies in testing. Another, of course, is do we really need to be testing for everything and every athlete? Uh, it's inconvenient for the athlete. It's inconvenient for the organization. It's expensive. Uh, and this gets back to the why do we care question. Uh, so there, there is some validity to that, that we really need to screen for everything, um, especially when there are different laws in different places. So here in Colorado, obviously, and in Washington, um, marijuana is legal. But many sporting organizations don't allow it. Uh, you can be fined or, uh, or suspended for having it found, uh, if, if you test positive for it, um, but, of course, if it's legal in the state, that, that, that creates sort of a tricky issue. We're not breaking the law, um, but, again, of course, it's up to the sporting organization. Uh, and, again, marijuana isn't really a performance enhancer. Do we really need to be testing for all of these, uh, all these compounds? 
uh, especially those that don't actually change athletic performance. Uh, and the other issue here is uh, highlighted by the Balco scandal, where there's this sort of arms race between uh, the tests that the organizations run, the tests that are available to run, uh, and new drugs that are developed. Um, so if you can develop a performance enhancing drug that isn't detectable by any of the tests currently being used, then there's a big market for that. And of course, it takes a lot of resources and time to develop new tests for every new substance that comes on the market. Uh, now, in terms of government regulation of these substances, uh, of course, amphetamines, we've already talked about, they're on Schedule 2. Uh, Schedule 2 being, of course, the second most restricted. There are legitimate uses for amphetamines. Uh, and as there's a section of your book that points that out, that there are a lot, there are a disproportionate number of athletes uh, who have been diagnosed with attention disorders. And what's the prescription? Well, it's things like Adderall and Ritalin, uh, which are forms of amphetamine. Uh, so amphetamines are on Schedule 2 because they do have a legitimate medical use. Uh, Anabolic steroids have a number of legitimate medical uses. They're on Schedule 3. Uh, human growth hormone isn't actually scheduled, uh, but it is a felony to use it if it's not for a legitimate prescribed purpose. So if you're, if you're deficient in HGH, you can get a prescription for it, and I, that obviously is not illegal. But using HGH if you don't have a legitimate reason, it's, so that's a felony. Okay, that will do it for performance enhancing drugs. Uh, next time, we'll talk about drug prevention and drug treatment. Uh, in particular, we'll look at how our society has understood drug use and, and how to prevent it, how to treat it. Um, how do we address it? There are a variety of methods, depends on your point of view of drug use. Uh, and then how effective are these methods? Uh, so we'll talk about that next time, and I will see you then.